Okay, hey boys and girls, uh, today we're going to be talking uh, with Corey. Corey Steuben is our president here and also uh, mm, probably one of maybe the best uh, guy we've got in here on, on uh, suspensions and Corey knows a lot about everything that's going on with, uh, with the, uh, the uh, electric, uh, electric hookups and the suspension system. So Corey and I are going to be talking a little bit today about the front and the rear uh, suspension systems. So um, let's just jump right into it. Yeah, thanks Sandy. Well, first we'll start over here. If we look at the rear suspension, yeah. if I had to give this a grade for a five link rear suspension from a cost and performance perspective, I give it a grade of an A. And the yeah. only reason I don't give it an A plus is because this link isn't perfectly straight. So when you're designing a suspension system from scratch, if you want ideal uh, cost and weight and strength, if you can have each of these five links be perfectly straight, it allows you to choose a low cost manufacturing method. I'm holding a Tesla link in my hand right here. They chose to use this pipe style uh, with two welded ends. Um, Ford has used these low cost stampings, the U channel, but when they put this slight bend in, notice they had to actually close it out and weld it because the, the loads that you see when it isn't perfectly straight it ends up putting a lot of pressure in different areas. What this does is as the travel comes up, it's avoiding hitting uh, usually the rail or some other aspect of the body. Yeah. So rather than compromise the interior space, you spend a little more money making this link um, curved. Uh, other vehicles we've seen <coughs> will have a massive compromise where it'll be shaped almost like a droop yeah. and they have to go to a forging to be able to accommodate the loads. And maybe I'll, we'll pop up a picture of, of what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. All in all, I, I thought that the, uh, the suspension, again, I, I give it a, a nine out of a 10 because I really like, from a rear suspension standpoint, I, I like this style. Um, and to me, a lot of what they've done here, it may not be 100% like Tesla, but at the end of the day, uh, this is pretty damn good for the guys that are fooling around with electric vehicles. I really can hardly wait to get into the electric motor. This is where the PM motor is, the, the permanent magnet motor. So we're going to be very interested in seeing what's going to be going on underneath there. And here we go. Yeah. And we were going to hit on suspension a little bit today. What I have in my hand is the two lower links from the Tesla Model Y. They're also almost identical on the Tesla Model 3. Uh, Ford has chosen to go with a standard McPherson strut with a single ball joint for the, for the pivot of the suspension. When we're talking about virtual ball, the advantages you get is you don't actually have a single pivot point. You have a torsion link and a compression link. And as the knuckle rotates, the, the ball joint ends up being further out. That gives you enhanced, enhanced uh, lateral feel, stability, and the feedback to the car, to the driver is more like a BMW. So almost every BMW has virtual ball. Many Mercedes-Benz have virtual ball. This is what we'd see on a typical sedan. You get a few advantages, better turning circles. So this Ford uh, Mach-E has a 38-foot turning circle. The Tesla Model 3 and Model Y have a 39.8-foot uh, turning circle. The VW ID4 has an even better turning circle of 33. So if there's one complaint I have is when Sandy and I took our road trip, when we're backing in or parking or turning in a parking lot, it really is not the best turning circle. But the benefit you get is when you're actually driving the vehicle, yeah. it tracks on center better and the stability is, far, is superior. far superior. The only advantage that you've got with just the McPherson strut is this is wicked cheap in comparison to what Corey just showed you. Um, this is a less expensive uh, route to take um, and it's a lot more conventional to what you'd normally yeah. see. So, so if you're looking for a price reduction, there you go. Um, and if you're looking for a BMW ride, you're, you're going to be looking at yeah. uh, virtual ball. When I'm looking at this TE connector right here, this is a common off-the-shelf yeah. component. What do you notice about Ford's connectors? Common. Now this is the perfect example of the difference between Ford and Tesla. Okay. How many locating brackets do they have? One, two. 
Look at how elegantly these are designed to perfectly flow the cable yeah. in the right direction. It looks like an engineer spent a significant amount of time. They are snapped together with no, um, no zip ties. They have two here. Look how poorly they're designed. They don't even align to the locating point. Then look at the level of refinement here. They just had a tiny little piece come out and locate right there. Look at the level of refinement and on how this guides it. This is packaged really loosely and they had to rely on three zip ties. Same material. Mm. So you got PA66, PA66. Tesla's so proud they, they slapped their Tesla symbol oh, on here. Oh, oh, oh. This is a microcosm of the difference between Tesla and but Ford. But this, the Tesla part has been designed by Tesla. This would have probably been designed by Yazaki or somebody that, that's, uh, that's uh, a Correct. sub-supplier. So that's the other big difference between what happens when you do it internally versus externally. Now That probably won't get us uh, much work out of Yazaki, but or anybody else for that matter, but, but at the end of the day, but what But what, what, what is paramount in EVs? Every gram, yeah, every right. ounce, every gram, every centimeter. How long is this? <clears throat> 67 centimeters. How long is this? 100. Mm. How long was Ford working on this design before they decided they must have their uh, high voltage connection back here? When did they decide that this was ideal or were they given this based on a common off-the-shelf component? The inverter is partially, inverted, uh, partially integrated into the EDU, partially, but you can still see it's a separate box. Yeah. And quite frankly, these are good points. So having, um, having nine, basically they could have shrunk this by at least four, maybe five inches by taking that and plunking mm -hmm. it into yeah. here. Okay, and, um, and so that's definitely something we should put up because if we take five inches off of there, what did you say that was? Millimeters, this was 67, Six, that's 100. 100, so 100 millimeters, uh, let's, that's five inches, um, what? Take another 100 off. Yeah, 100 off, I guess. So they, they could have got rid of 100, and then maybe if, uh, I don't know where this is placing in the, in right the battery there. pack. Yep. Center. So, um, so could have the, they could exactly. have chosen to have it. Yeah, right there. So it, it could have been even shorter than Tesla's. Give me that thing for a second. Yeah, could have been, sh well, maybe not. Could have been shorter than Tesla's. Mm. Yeah, it could have been shorter if they would have, if they would have uh, popped it in there. But this high voltage wire represents the most expensive wiring you right. can have on a vehicle. Do we know whether that's copper or is this aluminum? Um, uh, we tore down the Model 3. We can get that. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, um, I wanted to, I, I don't want to destroy this thing yet. Come so. in here, Zach. Plate heat exchanger. Yeah. So Tesla had a plate heat exchanger to uh, pull the heat out of the gear oil and transfer yeah. it into ethylene glycol. The VW ID4 that we looked at, they're only cooling with ethylene glycol pumped into the outer jacket of the housing, mm. Tesla style. So the only reason you're gonna have a plate heat exchanger is because you're gonna have two different fluids flowing through it. You would never yeah. have a plate heat exchanger um, to pump the same fluid in and same fluid out. Mm -hmm. um, this EDM is larger yeah. than both the VW and the Tesla. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing why they have such a long <coughs> guide here on this cover. So I'm assuming that there's other applications for this inverter throughout Ford because this looks like an unused port. Well, to me, there's, there's, some, there's some other uh, aspects here that I, I don't quite understand. I thought that Ford was gonna run on the same platform as the ID4. Mm -hmm. The, the new, whatever it's called, platform. And that doesn't appear to be, this doesn't appear to look at all like what we saw out of uh, Volkswagen. So where is, 
Where's this commonality uh, between the two companies coming from? There is not. I have seen not a connector, not a battery cell, not a structural design decision. Even the, the motors in the front and the rear are completely different. Look okay, so is this the same as the, uh, you know, uh, they, they bought into Rivian and then walked away from Rivian? Is, is that the same sort of deal? It's got to be. Look at how they mount the front motor. So the front induction motor is hung just like you'd hang a four-cylinder engine. So every yeah. front-wheel drive, four-cylinder powertrain uh, for Ford and many OEMs, they hang off the rails. So they're using this large cross-car beam yeah. to, to hang off the rails. Then there's two large isolators that are tucked up into that right. beam. Then they're using what we call a torque strut to react the, the torque load mm -hmm. in the lower cradle. Right. This is how OEMs have mounted powertrains in the front of vehicles forever. And, and you still see the same attempt and methodology. Nothing's wrong about it, but there's no ingenuity. Well, here's the deal. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think that maybe one of the reasons that they're doing it that way is because this is their first kick at the cat, probably with an induction motor. And if it goes bad, can I drop it faster by, you know, by using that kind of a method? I'm not 100% sure that that I would want to do it that way. I like the Tesla route, uh, but it could be that there's some kind of a, a thought down the, down, the, yeah. down the road that this is going to take less. If, if they have to take it apart, it'll have less yeah. maintenance cost, and it's similar to what they've had before, yeah. so their maintenance people will know how to use it. Yeah. Roll this. this. Remove all of this to get motor. Yeah, I know. I, I, don't, I don't see the advantage at all. So I could be wrong. Here's something that baffles me. You have this elegantly designed cable from Tesla, which is very similar to what they're using on the rear uh, for the Mach-E. Now look at the, connect the connector they're using for the front. So the question is why? Why? Why is it different? It doesn't have to be different. No, it doesn't. The methodology for protecting the end runner. Wait a minute. Are we looking at the two? Oh, I know what it is, two engineers. So one engineer has commonized this part, and the other engineer is doing what he does over in the other end. So again, this is where Tesla's kicking everybody's butt, because why? Because their people talk to each other. And the commonization is probably, these two guys might sit right next to each other. <clears throat> but commonization doesn't get you promoted. So, uh, so this is kind of like one of those things that it's just, it's just the OEM yeah. way of doing business. Just like you were saying about hanging the induction motor the way we've always hung it. it, it, it if you give a guy, I mean, there's a thing called uh, the, the paradigm paralysis, mm -hmm. right? So that if you've been doing it that way your whole life, you're not going to change. It just isn't going to mm -hmm. happen. Uh, you, you, you wind up in a situation where your rules and regulations tell you you can't move. And so consequently, that's why I'm seeing these kinds. Of, again, there, we have this little phrase, um, it's 10% uh, it's technology, 90% psychology. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has been doing this this way forever, and you pull that away from them and say, okay, now you're going to be doing an electric motor, not a, not a, a small gas engine. What's he going to, I mean, he's going to rely on his past experiences mm -hmm. and there's... That's what happens. So uh, Another factor that could have driven <coughs> the choice of this connector, this box right here is the inverter for the induction motor. It's a separate box. It's also located relatively far away from the motor. This line right here is your AC line, so it's sending your three-phase to the motor uh, yeah. to drive it. Uh, the rear EDM on the Mach-E, that's integrated. The front and rear yeah. EDM on the Tesla, that's integrated. But this connector right here and this yeah. connector right here may have been dictated by this off-the-shelf component. So one of the things that you harped on extensively when we were looking at the thermal system is yeah. that when you're using off-the-shelf components, whether that's a pump or a valve, you have to make compromises when it, when it comes to the potential for commonality or cost savings throughout the vehicle. Okay, so where do you think, well, we, I know we haven't taken it apart, but if we're going to be buying off-the-shelf components like the inverter and whatnot. Mm -hmm. What, who would be selling those off-the-shelf components? Suppliers. Yeah, I know suppliers, but who supplier? Who? 
who, who do we know that's, uh, that's uh, fooling around with selling? These are usually, you know, tuned to the, uh, to the application. Yeah. So if they're, if they're buying these things off the shelf, who else is using them? Because you can't make any money on these things mm -hmm. unless you can, you can get, I mean, is this, is this like one of the components that we couldn't see uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the VW? Is Ford and VW sharing? Uh, nope, this is integrated. In the VW, um, well, I'm, there maybe, are, maybe nope. the boards underneath it are, is what I'm saying. I mean, uh, really and truly, the box doesn't care. Yeah. Is it is it the stuff inside? Yeah. I don't know. I, I to to me, the the big advantage to this was the fact that I can just take it and shove it in place. I like that from a, an assembly standpoint. It on the line. This is like a single station. I can pop that up. Maybe two more stations for buttoning it all in place. Boom, done. So anyway, we're talking about the uh, connectors here, and Al brought up a good point. Uh, by the way, this is Al Steyer. Um, anyway, this, uh, this, this connector and this connector, the one I was just uh, saying is done by somebody else. One of the things that Al did not like about this connector is that you just have this bolt screwing it in. Um, and I saw this before and forgot about it, but this is, um, this is my least favorite connector, and Al said the same thing. These, these connectors suck. Yeah, so it was let's, difficult to pull out, even yeah. with the bolt undone. It still, you had to actually pull it out and force it out. Right, yeah, so screwdrivers and all kinds of other tools. So you go over here, and you look at, these are my favorite. We used to call them Bosch connectors. I don't know if that's the real name anymore, but I love this connector because when I, when I have it locked like that, it's locked in place. When I want to take it out, I push this, I pull it down and it pops right out. This is a really good idea, especially if you're, um, especially if you're um, uh, the operators putting this together. These things really work well. They grab, they lock, they, they're easy to get out. You push them out, it's, it's, CPA, it's great. Really easy yeah, so the CPA is a, a little safety device that, uh, that basically makes sure that you're locked in place. <clears throat> anyway, so, there you go. All right, good. Okay, thanks again for uh, watching uh, this, uh, this portion of Monroe Live. Uh, being as Corey's here, I'm going to have to ask if, um, if you can, click the little button uh, and say that you want to be a subscriber. Um, it makes him happy, really happy. Look at, see? Really happy. Really happy. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and stay tuned for more Monroe Live as we dig in further into the Mach-E. Thank you all. Bye.